want to thank you all for coming. It's a beautiful day. And it's a great weekend in San Francisco. Yes. <laughs> yes. I did the Fog Art Fair and to have this wonderful exhibition. And I'm very, very thrilled to have Peter Saul here, who grew up in San Francisco, and I practically raised him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Adam Lindemann, who represents him, who lives in New York and in downtown Montauk. <laughs> and uh, I'll let you go ahead. And, uh, I'll have other remarks later on. Okay, good. So thank you, John. I just want to thank you for uh, really inviting this show to your beautiful gallery. And um, you kind of made uh, a fantasy, an idea that I had come true, because um, of course I'm a huge fan of Peter's. And um, this painting, uh, which comes from the collection of Alan Frumpkin, needed to, in my mind, in my in my fantasy be seen in San Francisco. And so it's really never been seen anywhere. Uh, it's been in his collection since, since 1979. And um, I, I just love the idea of Peter Saul's San Francisco works in San Francisco. And I, I'm, I'm glad that you allow for this dialogue, because we can talk about what San Francisco means to Peter. I've been a fan of Peter since the age of 13 or 14 since I grew up with um, his dealer's son, uh, Alan Frumpkin's son, Robert. And so uh, I've kind of grown up with these works and now the pleasure and the honor of spending time with Peter and talking to him has been really something that has sustained me and from which I've learned so much. And anyway, I'm happy you're here. And Peter, here's the first question. <laughs> um, it doesn't have to do with uh, war politics, violence, uh, battle of the sexes, uh, Vietnam, uh, and, all, and, and art history, and figuration versus abstraction, and all the other topics that you've really challenged and, and addressed in your work for so many years. What is it about San Francisco for you that it keeps coming back in your work? Well, it's a, it has a lot of symbols that are completely obvious that I could deal with, like the Golden Gate Bridge and the Transamerica Building. And these are things, Golden Gate Park, the windmill is out there, I believe. All these things that were, that were there that were obvious that I could remember, even though I don't live here for a heck of a number of years, uh, it attracted me as something I could do. And I remembered actually in 1940, 41, approximately, I went with my parents to see an exhibition in somebody's uh, garage of a rather large painting of San Francisco that was painted for the jokes. This was a non-professional artist. I've forgotten the name for about 20 or 30 years, but he existed and this thing happened, this show happened in his garage probably. And there was a painting of San Francisco similar to this, pretty big, like 40 by 70, not this big, but you know, fairly big for those days. And it had the obvious jokes in it. The cable car came to the top of the hill and went way up in the air. And uh, the driver crossing the Golden Gate Bridge looked down and was very startled by the distance to the water. Boring, boring, okay, I'll admit. But it was jokes that people would understand. And I saw that painting in 1940, 41, and I remembered it, even though it was not a professional artist, I'm sure. And I was thinking of abstract expression as what really prompted the painting to happen was, I remembered this art movement, abstract expressionism, where you throw around color and the picture will look better. You know what I mean? Blue there, red there, blue there, red there. You know, it's, you just scream it, just stream it around. And it does help the picture to look fresh. So I thought, how about doing that with things instead of with uh, paint splots, you know? And then I thought, San Francisco, that's where they had the earthquake in 1906. Everything was messed up. Now, it's bound to happen again in another 10,000 years. It's going to happen. So why not paint a picture of that? For some reason, I don't paint pictures of things I've seen. I like to make stuff up. And uh, that's, what I, that's what started me going on this. The first version of this subject is in the collection of the Metropolitan, I believe. 
I was very pleased they bought the picture. I think it was just a, a, a simple thing where uh, they wanted to buy a picture from people, artists working in various parts of the country, you know, Seattle, Austin, Texas, that's me, uh, you know, Florida, maybe. So they have a, a collection of paintings that are of zero value, but nevertheless are extremely interesting, much more interesting than their actual valuable collection, which is the usual thing, which you have definitely seen many times and was never trying to be interesting to look at, if you know what I mean. Important only, but not to look at, to think about. Anyway, so I started out on my picture, and uh, it was popular enough that it sold right away to the Metropolitan. So I was so encouraged that I just continued right away, and I made a number of others. I made a few big ones. One's in Italy somewhere. Uh, one belongs to somebody else, so I don't know. And frankly, I don't keep track of pictures, uh, where they go. I, I sell them outright if I can to a friendly art dealer. And so far, I've been able to do that since 1960. So, I mean, I've been very, very lucky. Um, if there's a weak point to my art career, which I haven't mentioned previously, it's that um, I've met dozens and dozens of artists as a result of having my teaching job in Texas. They came as guests for some reason or other, or living in New York City, or, or being friends. I mean, my wife wanted to meet them, you know, Sally. So, I mean, I've met dozens of artists, but for some reason, this unexplainable, I haven't gotten to know any of them, really. So, I mean, I've been extremely isolated <laughs> from usually from people's opinion and from my opinion of them. I haven't bothered to form an opinion of other artists and I don't know what their opinion of me is either. So it's just a complete isolation thing, which I started out because uh, I wanted to be isolated. Uh, I wanted to have a situation where I get to work at home with a beautiful woman and cigarettes to smoke, you know. And <laughs> no kidding. That's, and it worked. It worked. In 1960, that worked. And I celebrated by not knowing anybody, quite frankly. And I, I didn't notice any, know anybody until I got to California. And then I had a little flutter of getting to know people. Like William T. Wiley came to my door. For some reason, these are artists that I don't understand why I'm, I didn't see them at the museum this morning. Instead of which, I saw the standard thing. You know, famous artists, Jackson Pollock, and all, all, all that stuff, you know what I mean? <laughs> stuff that I know very well that's important and valuable financially, but which we've all seen a whole lot of times. So anyway, I, uh, that was, that's my, my whole art story, really, in a moment. <laughs> and what about the, is, I had this idea that the Golden Gate Bridge meant something to you, that it is Well, it, it was obvious that it was right there. And the one around the corner may be the first one, or one of the first. I just wanted to mess up the bridge. See, my art is an art of rebellion, really. And as long as I'm rebelling against art style, which is obvious, I think, I might as well rebel against sound architecture and uh, bridge construction. So I basically, I mean, I. <laughs> I enjoyed breaking the rules, but the rules have to be harmless rules. Rules of design, appearance, things like that. I'm not breaking the rule of driving within reasonable speed and on the right side of the street. I'm not doing anything really stupid where you die immediately. This, this, my kind of rebellion is a harmless type. It has to do with picture painting and uh, it, it's been fine. I'm, I'm glad to see these old pictures again. Quite frankly, I like them. <laughs> um, and Peter, in some of your works, like the self-defense that's over there, I mean, you've really attacked police brutality, racism, oh, sexism, uh, how the Black Panthers were treated. How did you come to be, I, I think of when I was trying to engage you in conversation the other day about Afghanistan, uh, oh. the Korean War, the Vietnam War, I, I, and, 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 and how 
the whole thing with Afghan and everything that happened between Trump and Biden and all that, I realized that I couldn't engage you. I couldn't get you to really give me anything. And when I, I will. I think you're just a, you are really a pacifist and you, you just believe that it's all wrong. Well, that's true, I am a pacifist, but I wouldn't inflict that on my painting. If a painting wants to be warlike, okay, <laughs> let it be warlike, even though I am pacifist, it's true. I, I, I don't inflict myself on my pictures. I look for something that's interesting to look at. And the Vietnam War was right there on page one, and for unknown reasons, serious artists weren't dealing with it. it was, I mean, I don't know if anybody else was dealing with it. Soon enough, uh, People were dealing with these things. The painting of the first version of this, which is at the Met, coincides with um, Zap Comics. So there, you got something going, you know. I, I remember Robert Crumb's visit. He didn't. He wasn't very impressed with the Vietnam pictures, like ho hum, you know. <laughs> I was working. I was working on the Saigon painting when Crumb visited, and. Uh, he was not impressed, nor were any artists. The artist dislikes the Vietnam thing. I got going because I falsely thought, this is a real mistake on my part, that the whole world, world was turning, the whole, not the whole world, the whole country was turning towards psychology. And it was getting really interesting. Everybody had homicidal tendencies, you know. Sexuality was totally unclear. Everything just like messed up. Whereas before it had been totally clear, everything was defined properly. Homosexuals, were, it was a serious crime, like 20 years in prison in most states. And uh, let's see, what else can I say? Well, abortion was very, very serious, 20 years, whoa. I mean, I won't go into some of these things because I don't feel like getting personal today. But, <laughs> Um, I just, I just wanted relief, you know. I wanted a rebellion to take place against all of this stuff. I wanted freedom. I wanted to just spend my day in Paris or Rome, wherever I was living. I didn't want to talk any language. I, all I wanted to be able to do was order a beer. Just like, you know, un beer, s'il vous plaît. That's it. That's all the French I was interested in. Although I did learn several hundred other words so that I could get a hotel room and do a whole lot of other stuff. Anyway, next question. <laughs> so I, I, I often think about your career because you've spanned real, really decades. And yeah. um, you, you go from the 60s all the way to today. And although your work has changed, still your language has remained the same and you've been true to yourself. But I think that people we very easily, since we all live in the moment, we forget that the 60s you were painting electric chairs when Andy Warhol was doing electric chairs, and then so. the 70s you were doing this when minimalism. So how, how did you keep to your decision to stick to figuration and oh. your style when the whole world wasn't with you? Well, uh, it's true. I, I was not the least bit discouraged by negative reviews or being ignored. Uh, I don't know why that is. Golly, I don't have any, any real reason behind that. Uh, my idea of an art idea is to have an idea of something to paint a picture of. So the Golden Gate Bridge was a great idea. I mean, I woke up one morning in Mill Valley, California, in whatever it was, 1965 or something like that, and uh, I thought, hey, Golden Gate Bridge, it's right there and nobody's using it. No artists were painting that. I, and the artists that I met were basically just three, William T. Wiley, Robert Hudson, and, Whoop, and Bill Allen, and they weren't going to paint a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. And then I met Bruce Nauman a few months later, and he's not going to paint a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge, so <laughs> why not just do it, you know? So I did it right away. I grabbed hold of the Golden Gate Bridge as a subject, and I was very pleased to have it. And that's my idea of art all the way through. I think of subjects one after another. It never occurs to me to follow these, in my opinion, the really stupid art ideas that you read in the art magazines, you know? I just, they make me laugh. 
I eventually got into insulting them as well. They are funny, you know, people believe the latest stage in art is paint gets thicker, gets thinner, you know what I mean? Emptier, fuller, whatever, that kind of stuff. Technical things make me laugh. Uh, so the idea was to keep on finding subjects, and I'm still doing it right now. My next show is in London uh, in May 26, and that has some things in it that are amusing, maybe, maybe to you. A, a Superman and God are inhabiting the same body and getting mad at each other up in the sky. They're on a golden couch in the clouds. That's what I'm painting right now. I, I, I just like to think of things and do them. It's as simple as that. Uh, the ideas of art make me laugh sincerely, but I'm not against them. If they help the picture to look good, good, more power to them. I've used cubism a lot. It's very useful, especially when painting women. They aren't cubistic at all. So when you paint a woman cubistically, you're going against nature in, in a way which is either humorous or dangerous, you know what I mean? And uh, abstract expressionism does help cities to look more interesting. This one is an example. You know, I got two of them right here. And um, let's see, another one. Oh, the one I like best, obviously, is surrealism. Do anything you want, you know, like just still life. Uh, the hard thing about still life for me is it's hard to paint the space in between the objects. So in this case, I just piled the objects in, in the abstract expressionist manner, so there wouldn't be any space in between the objects. And, and that helped me to get the picture going in a way that I think is interesting. This is the first of the still lifes that I painted. It suddenly occurred to me, hey, I can paint a still life. Like it recently occurred to me I can paint a bowl of flowers. And I'm just now getting ready for the first bowl of flowers that are free from the nature's appearance for some stupid reason. I mean, I'm subject to these stupid results, uh, reasons is uh, I felt the need to go and look at actual flowers before painting a bowl of flowers. And I felt that I should consult nature. And um, I had my, my wife pick the bouquet of flowers for me to look at. And I went into the garden and looked at these things growing. I, I never did that when I, when I was painting people, cars, buildings, or any other thing, guns, knives, whatever. So I, I feel a little stupid when it comes to painting bowls of flowers, but I finally got to the point about a week ago where I can do it without bothering with nature, you know? So my next bowl of flowers, I just do it. Don't have to worry about the darn things in the ground. <laughs> And you, you studied and you lived in Europe early on in your career. I did study there, but I lived there, you yeah. Lived. How, how do you, uh, why do you think the Europeans have always loved Peter Saul when some oh, Americans... Oh, I think that's clear. That's clear because it rebels against the, this U.S. monolithic taste thing, which I paid no attention to, which was easy to rebel against for me. For unknown reasons, other people other artists I've met, for reasons I don't quite understand, have a lot of trouble not obeying some portion of the rules that, that are there, it outlined in the lectures that you receive if you get this advanced degree, this MFA thing. I, I don't think I've met anyone, well, I must have, but I don't remember, who hasn't had an MFA or had tried to get one. And as a result of getting this degree, you learn how to talk and respect some of the ideas that have guided artists. And I didn't do that. I didn't learn any of these things, so what the hell? I just do it. And you taught at the University of Texas for eight, 19 years. 19 years. And one of the one of your alums is here in the room, Sarah. <laughs> but <laughs> you've you've told me a few different things about what it was like to have Peter Saul as a teacher. As an artist, could you really help other artists? I, I didn't, well, I, I didn't tell them to do anything. I decided to be extremely friendly to them. So I, I approached it conversationally and attempted to find out, I've said this before actually, I attempted to find out uh, what the person was trying to do 
and uh, help them to do that, the most co a common thing would be something like, I really love Van Gogh and I want to paint just like him, but I love Rothko too, what should I do? And so I'd say, well, use the Rothko as the background, take a piece of the color, and I put the Van Gogh in front. That was my kind of a simple solution to help these people, and it worked. I mean, they, they felt relieved that they weren't held to account in my class for doing what was probably questionable artistically. And sometimes the students had very good ideas that they shared with me. Uh, they weren't stupid, but by any means, they were, they were very intelligent grown-ups for the most part who were stuck for units and needed to have an art class of some time <laughs> type. And my, my art class was available to be entered, just like any other art class. And in 17 people were always signed up. I never looked into why this was or how it worked, but 17 people were in all the art classes, and in my art class, at least 10, and maybe as many as 15, uh, didn't want to actually paint a picture. I asked them, would you like to paint a picture? And they would say, well, not really. I mean, I need units. My parents are gonna kill me if I don't graduate, that kind of thing. So, okay, okay, take an A and go away. So I gave them an A and, and they, they went away. And I did not get fired for this behavior. <laughs> the state of Texas wanted me to be brutal. And they wanted all the art teachers to do things like, you paint that still life by 30 or I'm gonna flunk your ass. <laughs> yes, sir, yes, sir, you know, that's what they wanted. They wanted toughness. I didn't do it. And they let me get away with this for 19 years. And I, looking back on it, I think the reason why it's because they thought I was a famous artist who was willing to live there instead of New York City. And this struck them as amazing, like, you know, sacrificing yourself for some reason, because they wanted nothing but to be in New York City. The art teachers in Austin when I was there, like, please let me out of the town. Let me be in New York. Let me be knowing artists. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And I was very happy knowing them and being there. And I liked it a lot. I loved my teaching job. I felt I was helpful. I don't know if I really was. Complete mystery. <laughs> uh, I remember when I spoke to Massimiliano Johnny and you had the New Museum retrospective oh, last yeah. year, which was amazing. And uh, I, I think he did a good job. And I'm so happy that the New Museum did the show. But um, he was very worried. And when, oh, yeah. when he exhibited the Angela Davis on the cross, the bla yeah. famous Black Panther, and some of the pictures that depict violence and, yeah, yeah. and uh, sexism and racism and all the stuff that you've painted. He was nervous about what reaction the museum would have. And I think that overall, from Calvin Tompkins to the press in general, the show was uh, a knockout success. But he was so nervous about yeah. showing the works. Why were you never nervous? Uh, because I didn't feel like I was going to be attacked, really. But actually, there is a, I was wrong to not be nervous. Uh, I should have been nervous because, actually, people are not interested in, in that kind of thing. I made a huge mistake, principally with Angela Davis. I mean, I admit this is a mistake. Psychology was taken over the Bay Area. You know what I mean? Uh, maniacs were loose. Women were hitchhiking still and getting killed. I mean, this was happening in Bay Area. This is like 1960s. And I, I got into this book club, uh, psychiatric book club, because a psychiatrist whose son played with my son came to the house, he took one look at the painting I was painting, and, and he said, you need to be part of this book club. <laughs> <laughs> he really thought I was sicko, which I may be anyway. So, so that's how I got into it. And I enjoyed the heck out of it. And I read all these books about the life stories of lunatics, and I liked them a lot, enjoyed these stories, and, and that influenced my painting a lot. I should not have combined that with Angela Davis, the Black Panthers, or any other group of black people, but I did just for the heck of it. Quite frankly, uh, I don't have a lot of the feelings that other people have about these things. I realize now, Sally does, and she reminds me not to make this mistake anymore. But I simply don't mind looking at objects, art objects, I don't agree with. 
really, you know? I mean, my idea of relaxation, while I'm waiting for paint to dry, which is like 10 minutes maybe or 15 minutes, I browse in my Hitler books. I read about Nazi Germany art, you know, look at it again. It's interesting and why people liked it and why it was in museums and that kind of thing. And I look at uh, history of Germany in World War II. Even though I suffered from anti-Semitism, I don't mind reading about it, oddly enough. Nothing bothers me in words and pictures, it turns out. I'm just quite, I have my own thoughts already, and so I'm not worried about somebody else's thoughts, is what it amounts to. Anyway, I shouldn't have felt like that. My wife doesn't feel like that. I haven't met any other human beings who agree with me about this. It's just one of those things, you know. I, I made a series of paintings starting around, well, starting in 65 and running through 73. God, for some unknown reason, I even did a, they're not here, but I did a bunch of uh, art world celebrities. One of the artists that I knew gave me the idea, Bill Geis, it was really crazy. We are crossing the Golden Gate Bridge after, for some reason, and he said, why don't you just let anything happen in a picture. Just let everybody fuck everybody and kill everybody and just let it all happen. I said, you've got a good idea there. So I did this on a series of card pieces of cardboard, starting with uh, that famous art critic, Clement Greenberg, and proceeding through, oh God, anyone I could find a photograph of, it, mostly in art form or in time and life, you know, and whatever. Art form was a good, Way. Anyway, this was highly insulting and totally lunatic, but I enjoyed doing it, and it actually surprised me that other people didn't laugh at it with me. You know, I, I feel often during these years, these California years, 1964 um, through 75, when you see these pictures, I feel often that I was out of touch with, with human uh, people people's feelings quite a bit. And uh, hopefully I've corrected myself. If you buy these paintings, I'm sure they're at a discount, you know? But they are <laughs> worth money. Well, they that... are worth money, you know that? I was surprised. <laughs> these are paintings I sold for $300 each to Alan Frumkin, these, these weird old things, in, in pornographic uh, visions of people. And, uh, he still They're has now them. worth 50,000, some of them. So, you know, things progress. And nobody's throwing them away. And no one's insulted, really. I, I met a very nice blonde woman in Germany who worked for the museum there who really treasures her, her one of, I don't know, Frank Stella and the Queen of England or something like that, you know, <laughs> screwing away. I don't know. You know what I mean? Total insult based on absolute nothing. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I would start again, except that I feel I've already done it. And of course, in today's climate, where people are very sensitive about objects they look at, uh, I, I don't want to go through this again. I mean, I, I made a, a deal with myself. Whatever possible, skin is pink and orange. And that's that. And there's no sex and violence in the same picture. Can have violence, okay you know, blow brains out, stuff like that, no problem. Can have sex, no problem with that, but not mix the two. Everybody's very sensitive for reasons I don't understand. I've never felt myself. Well, Peter, thank you. And uh, maybe we have some questions if anyone wants to. Uh... John. Uh, you were living in the Bay Area in the late 60s. From 64. 64. Well, no, 64 through um, 75. Oh, so you worked in San Francisco in the 50s or Bay Area? I was in Europe from 56 to 64. Before that, I was in St. Louis mostly. I went to art school in St. Louis. I just thought maybe you have been around for the sort of beat generation and all that. Ah. No, I missed it. You know, the thing is, my only knowledge of the Beat Generation before, it just we were kicked out of uh, Holland for not having visas. 
And the last thing I remember there, getting there in Holland before, this is 58 March, was a letter from my mother who said, we are going to the East Bay this weekend to look at the beatniks, but I don't think it's fair to look at people just because they don't take baths, do you? <laughs> and and I, I never had time to reply because we had to leave the country right then, bam. And then we're in Paris, and once we're in Paris, the whole different things. I never, never did answer my mother. And when I got back here, I found that things had changed in that direction, yeah. I don't know what I thought of it, it's just, it was the way things were, it was helping me somehow, I felt, to be interesting as, as a painter. Yeah. You spent your very early years as a young boy here. And I wonder, you mentioned that you lived in a house overlooking the water. And I wonder if any of that experience having looked over the water influenced the way you were thinking about later in your life. You well, maybe, that? maybe. I mean, I definitely saw San Francisco. Alcatraz was there. And before World War II, the big news was uh, people getting executed, quite frankly, you know when people would fry, that is, get the chair. <laughs> it was a big deal in the Chronicle, you know. Uh, and I was interested. I wanted to know what happened when people fried, like, is their body too hot to touch for a certain length of time? And then the guards say, OK, pull him out of the chair, you know. Time has come. Uh, gee, I don't know. I shouldn't have be interested in these things, but I am. And this <laughs> afternoon, to relax, I looked at true crime on, on TV, and it was very relaxing. Several people got, got out of being executed, and I, I looked at solemn statements by lawyers, interesting, mildly interesting, very relaxing. I didn't worry me any. That's it. I have a question. Wait, wait. Sorry. One before you, sorry. Sarah. I'm curious, um, when you were in who did I spend time with? My, my ex-wife, I, I, we were trying to get along. Uh, I didn't meet any artists, no, zero. I mean, sometimes artists would, would appear and they'd ask her, who's the guy with the suitcases? And she'd say, that's my boyfriend. And I said, okay, okay, enough of that. You know, they didn't ask any questions. Nobody was interested in me, period, frankly, as far as I can tell. I didn't have anybody looking at, well, people looked at my pictures when I painted them publicly in this public space, but I never spoke to them. They were French people. I don't know what it was all about, frankly. The art in France was completely withdrawn, very gray, very serious, the opposite of humorous, just really, I, uh, Matta helped me to find an art dealer, and that was a very important moment. I located his drawings at Galerie du Dragon in... Uh, Dragon. Dragon. In 59, I guess, 58, 59. I'm getting a little confused in this timing of myself. And anyway, so I had the idea that if I sent him some drawings, he'd help me find an art gallery. So I sent the drawings, and nothing happened for three months or so. I had his phone number as well, though I had no phone, of course. Uh, so I phoned him up through the landlord, phoned for me, and he was very startled to hear from me. He said, oh, Peter Saul, you sent me some drawings, didn't you? I said, yeah. He said, oh, go immediately to the Hotel Lutetia and contact Alan Frumkin because he's only in town for like three days or something. So I phoned the Hotel Lutetia. 10 minutes later and got through to him and he was there and he said, okay, okay, come see me, I'll be in the runting room. And I said, okay, so I can get more drawings together. And off I went on the subway in the metro and eventually I get to the Hotel Letitia. We're living in a broken down chateau just outside of Paris. Anyways, so got there and he took one look and. We hope, well, then I went downstairs because that's where the runting room was. It, it wasn't called the runting room. That's what he called it. I went downstairs and there was a guy at the bar drinking a cup of coffee and that was him. And uh, 
He said, I said, are you Mr. Frumpkin? He said, yeah. I, he said, show me what you got. So I showed him, or he took a look, I mean, I didn't show him. He just took the bundle and started looking at it. And uh, um, he said, at the end, he didn't make any comment. He just said, let's do business. What do you want for them? And I said, uh, $15 each. And he said, we can do better, $25 each. And any time you want more money, just send me four and I'll send you $100. So whew, money problem solved. At this time, the, the, the wage in Paris area for a worker was $200 a month. And I had probably five times that amount coming in. I also had a gallery in France and we got to get notice there, you know, in gallery in Paris, gallery Breteau, very important, though they quarreled like crazy. I eventually had to stop showing at Gallery Breteau because Frumpkin got so upset about it. Oh, forget it, you know. The, the galleries, they're never content. They're restless people. Usually, currently not. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> anyway, uh, Matta I never met until later. And when I did, it was a complete failure because um, my girlfriend had knitted us these sweaters to keep warm and they, were, they would look good today you know, freely done, freely knitted, big knots and stuff. And um, he said, where'd you get those silly sweaters? <laughs> Matta said that. And Vicky was very negative on that. Let's not even talk to this guy. So I didn't get to know Matta because he didn't like the sweaters that we were wearing. <laughs> and that's that. Shortly after, we had so much money that we bought a car, had a baby, and moved to Rome, Italy, where the weather would be better. One more. Who are some of the artists that you feel like influenced your work if you weren't knowing them socially? Ah. Uh, are there any artists that really impacted your practice and your Well, I, I, my, influence, uh, my influences are individual pictures that I see. Unfortunately for me, I didn't ask who the, gar who the artist was most of the time. If I had, I might even have been freaked out because, uh, it wasn't customary in the old days to dwell on the artist. You dwelled on the artwork. Um, the pictures I, I saw that really influenced me were Paul Cadmus, Coney Island, in 1939. He was in a book called American Art, which was, pub which was given to my mother by the Book of the Month Club as a gift. Uh, another thing that would influence me was comics very, very strongly. Comics I saw as a kid. Uh, crime does not pay, stuff like that. Um, a lot of this I thought about while I was sitting at the Dome Cafe, putting together my art style in 1958. Like, what have I, what have I got? What are they coming from? Crime does not pay, Donald Duck, electric chair, Mickey Mouse, uh, you know, I couldn't remember the uniforms of some of the important people like Daredevil. Well, I forgot, you know, I forgot the Green Lantern, I forgot his uniform. Uh, there were no, uh, let's see, oh, artists. Artists beyond that. Well, in later years, I get more influenced. Uh, Robert Williams. I, I was very interested in his work, which I got to know through Juxtapose, which was for sale in the art store in Austin, Texas. So I, I read Juxtapose, and even though most of it wasn't that great, I mean, frankly commercial, you know what I mean? Like, buy me. <laughs> Robert Williams was uh, really interesting to me, and I followed his adventures, and I actually met him too. When we moved to New York in 2000, and, uh, 2000 I guess, uh, I, I went to an opening, but he was a very distanced person. I, what he would do would be not to have the pictures for sale, and then on the last day he'd have an auction or something like that. I don't know. It was, it was, he was nervous about the art world, so I don't know. But anyway, I still look at his pictures occasionally, 
and I browse in his work just like a browse in Manet's work, you know. <laughs> I love the art of the 19th century, quite frankly, that does influence me. I like the whole thing, not just the ones who are in rebellion, like Manet, Monet, and so on, but the ones who are not in rebellion, like Tissot, Jerome, and so on. And I like them a lot, actually. And uh, I look at those pictures, uh, like them, very good. Uh, what else do I feel I think of? Well, at this moment, I, I can't think. I have a list in my pocket, but I'm not going to pull it out. <laughs> well, because, Peter, thank you. Because I'm not pulling it out, because the last time I did this was in the David Nolan Gallery about 20 years ago. And at the end of it, a woman said, Peter Saul, can you name any artist that you personally like? And I couldn't think of a single name. And so she said, that's what I thought. So I made a list of 50 artists that I'd met and liked and kept it in my wallet for 10 or 12 years. And it's only now that you've asked. That's the second time. And I have a list, but I cut it down to 50. Yeah, OK. Well, anyway, time passed. And here's my list in the wallet. Wait a second. Yeah, here it is, just where it's supposed to be. <laughs> Neil Roche, Eric Parker, Judith Bernstein, Cause, Jason Fox, Mark Greenwald, Catherine Murphy, Alex Katz, Philip Knoll, Stephen Westfall, B. Worst, Keith Meyerson, Dana Schutz, Chris Martin, and there's a few missing because I didn't think of their names, you know, when I made this list out. But I could easily make a list of 100 artists. It's just that for some accidental reason, I didn't get to know anybody. That's life, you know. I haven't missed it, actually. I've been a happy life without knowing anybody. OK, that's it. Well, Peter, thank you so much. And John, thanks for having us. Done? Yeah, champagne time. Okay. <laughs> that, was that was a burst of talk. That was great. That was great. Thank you.